Good morning. I'm Jane Harmon, the uh, president and CEO of the Wilson Center, a former nine-term member of Congress, not as, lo not as long serving as those I'm about to introduce, but we were all elected at the same time in 1992, uh, which was called the Year of the Woman. And I'm sure Peter King is very proud that he was elected <laughs> in the Year of the Woman. Welcome to the Wilson Center. Those who have tuned in uh, into our virtual events, and we hold them all the time, often two or three times a day, know that most of our recent work has focused on the ongoing pandemic, as it should. Uh, we have the expertise to talk about how coronavirus is, is, is uh, happening in real time everywhere, and it is happening everywhere, even in North Korea, no matter what the government says. Uh, but we also have the expertise in real time to address other issues. And so today we're talking about something else that infiltrates a healthy system, a healthy system, and can spread undetected for long periods of time corruption, which spreads via shadow banking and money laundering. The United States estimates that two to five percent of global GDP is stolen and laundered every year. And when most people think of the phrases shell company or tax haven, they probably think of places like the Cayman Islands or Switzerland. But the reality is that according to international tax to the International Tax Justice Network, the United States ranks second in the world for global financial secrecy. States like Delaware, Nevada, and Wyoming, all wonderful places, are well known sadly by those with dirty money for their loose regulations when it comes to setting up anonymous shell companies, which are the main way modern kleptocrats move around and launder their assets. Today, we will feature a conversation with two wonderful members of Congress who are dear, dear friends of mine and who know a lot about this subject. Let me say that when people ask if I miss Congress, where I did work for uh, into my ninth term before I left to take what I call a better job as head of the Wilson Center, uh, people ask if I miss Congress. And I say, not the place, but I miss the people. And who do you think I miss? I miss people like Carolyn Maloney and Peter King, very old, good friends of mine with whom I worked closely in the house. As I said, we were all freshmen together in the year of the woman, and Peter, you make a marvelous honorary woman. I mean this in the nicest sense. You've always been a person who is both uh, respectful and, and bipartisan in all the right ways. So. Uh, let me just mention one more thing, too, which is, speaking of women, Carolyn and I were uh, two of four members who went to Beijing in the 90s uh, for the fourth UN con uh, conference on women. And we were there when Hillary Clinton said those iconic words, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And Peter and I went at least once, but probably more, to Guantanamo Bay Prison and other places in our roles uh, on the House uh, Homeland Security Committee, where he did enormous service. And Carolyn, just to brag about Carolyn, is the new chair of the House Oversight Committee. And she's also vice chair of the Joint Economic Committee and a member of the Financial Services Committee. And I, I've said Peter's main service, at least the one that I remember and, and applaud so much, is on the House uh, Homeland Security Committee, where, which he chaired for, from 2005 to six when I was there and 2011 to 12, just when I left. That's not why I left Peter. So uh, they introduced last May a bill, uh, well, introduced last May, <laughs> last May, a bill passed the House in October and is being considered in the Senate. If signed, it would require shell companies to disclose their true beneficial owners when they are formed so that criminals can no longer hide in complete anonymity. We look forward to hearing uh, what these two uh, members of Congress uh, think about this and 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 the as, and uh, uh, to the <laughs> I look forward to hearing the specifics of their work on the topic. Uh, moderating our discussion is Matt Rajansky, who is chairman of our Kennan Institute uh, on Russia and the former Soviet republics. It is our oldest institute at the Wilson Center. Uh, 
of our 5,000 scholars over the 51 years of our existence, 1,400 come from uh, what was the former Soviet Union and what is now Russia and the former Soviet republics. And we are extremely able uh, to talk about uh, Russia in a way that I think none of our competitors can. And we're extremely able to talk about this topic because it is central to the work we do. So uh, please welcome Matt Wojanski and huge virtual hugs uh, to my, my dear, dear friends, uh, Carolyn and Pete. Well, thank you very much, Jane. Um, this is really a, a dream conversation to be able to have for somebody who works on uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the Eurasia region. Uh, I actually refer to it in my courses as the C word, corruption, uh, because it's so ubiquitous. And I almost joke with my students. And then, of course, I have to walk it back because I'm the professor and say, you know, if you answer any exam question with the C word, you're going to get at least a C. But, you know, it's not really very good advice. Uh, it is a huge topic. Um, and we're so lucky to be able to talk about this with real leaders in today's Congress uh, and for our country uh, on this topic. And I certainly uh, wish you success in your efforts to tackle it. Um, there's no question that stolen money and ill-gotten gains have been able to gallivant across the world uh, at an unprecedented rate. In fact, many have argued, and I think correctly so, that the entire course of development of the former Soviet world over three decades um, has been different as a result uh, of the access that leaders in that part of the world have had to Western markets to squirrel away their dirty money. Imagine the way in which they would have to govern their own countries differently if they had to keep their ill-gotten gains at home. Wouldn't they want a little bit more rule of law at home to protect that money rather than being able to rely on exporting it to jurisdictions like ours right here in the United States? So this is a topic that has implications, of course, for the American economy, where the dirty money gets squirreled away. Uh, you all understand that perfectly well. But for those of us who work on Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, uh, it is hugely important for the course of development uh, of an enormous chunk of the world. Um, Jane has ably introduced uh, the two members, uh, as well as the pending legislation, uh, the Corporate Transparency Act of 2019. I think they'll both talk about that a little bit more. I wanted to add just one more data point, which is very timely. Just this morning, I read on Facebook, which is um, almost the lingua franca in Ukraine these days, uh, including for members of the RADA, the parliament, uh, that a friend of mine who is in the RADA uh, has just sponsored a bill which would allow Ukraine to hire uh, the best foreign lawyers, so lawyers in the United States, lawyers in the United Kingdom, lawyers in Europe, to use the court systems of our countries in the West to go after those stolen assets in the West. Up to now, Ukraine has not been able to do that. They, they don't have the authority to spend their money to hire the lawyers in the first place. This is going to create the legal authority for them to do so. But there's kind of a, a hidden and very telling fact about this legislation, which is this legislation wouldn't make any sense if it weren't for the vast amounts that are being squirreled away in rule of law jurisdictions like ours. It's not like this money is sitting in some gray offshore haven, because there it wouldn't even make sense to file suit. You'd know you wouldn't get anywhere. By definition, this means that the money is being stolen and, and hidden in plain sight. And I think that's very much uh, what our conversation is going to be about today. A um, couple of housekeeping matters before I turn the floor over to our two speakers. Um, I want to remind you to stay up to date with uh, current events and publications on our website, as well as our podcast. Casts, uh, Ken and X and the Russia file. And in particular, on this topic, go to the Wilson Quarterly, wilsonquarterly.com, and play, even as you're listening, the Money Laundry Game. It's a fantastic interactive game and article on corruption and how the U.S. can more effectively combat it uh, by my colleagues, Gemily Safarolieva and Morgan Jacobs, who were instrumental in setting up today's event. You'll really have a blast if you like to choose your own adventure novels back in the day. You're really going to like this game, uh, even though the topic can be a little bit depressing. Also, uh, just a reminder that next week on Thursday, May 27th at 10 a.m., we'll be hosting uh, an event on the first year of President Zelensky in Ukraine uh, with three fantastic analysts uh, from the region. Finally, if you have questions during this conversation at any time, including right now, uh, submit them via email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org. Twitter at Kennan Institute or on our Facebook page. And please include your name and affiliation when you're sending in your questions. Now, 
It's my honor to turn the floor over first to Chairwoman Maloney to open, please. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting, inviting me to join you today. It is always a great pleasure to see my good friend Jane Harmon. We not only came to Congress together, we worked together on many important issues like the one we are addressing today. She came to Congress for all the right reasons, and we miss you tremendously, Jane. It's uh, great to see you're continuing uh, your values in your work at the Wilson Center. As, as you know, I, I've been working very hard on a bill called the Corporate Transparency Act, which would crack down on the illicit uh, use of anonymous shell companies. And I've been honored to work on this bill with my good friend, Peter King from New York, who has been a strong supporter of increasing transparency and strengthening law enforcement for many, many years. Uh, the bill passed the House last October with bipartisan support and the Senate Banking Committee has reached a co compromise on their version of the bill, which is very similar to our bill. So I'm optimistic about this bill being signed into law this year. This is one of the most pressing national security problems we face in our country, because anonymous shell companies are the vehicle of choice for money launderers, criminals, and terrorists. The reason they are so popular is because they can't be traced back to their true owners. Shell companies allow criminals and terrorists to move their money around in the US financial system and finance their operations uh, freely and legally. I began working on this bill after 9-11 when uh, New York City and other cities and areas in our country were terrified of terrorism uh, financing and we were working to crack down on it. Uh, unfortunately, we know that the U.S. is one of the easiest places in the entire world to set up anonymous shell companies. The reason why these shell companies are anonymous is because states don't require companies to name their true beneficial owners, the individuals who are collecting the profits and who outright own the company. We're the only advanced country in the entire world that doesn't already require disclosure of this information and frankly, it's an embarrassment. When the Panama Papers came out last year, one of the most common questions is, why weren't more Americans involved? And the answer is that Americans don't have to go to Panama to set up an anonymous shell companies. They can do it right here, legally, in the United States. But this isn't just an embarrassment we need to address. It's a problem that we really need to fix. These shell companies leave a gaping hole in our national security strategy. And the longer we wait to fix this problem, the more we put our country and our people at risk. As any FBI agent or prosecutor will tell you, far too many of their investigations hit a dead end at an anonymous shell company. And because they can't find out who the real owner of that shell company is, they can't follow the money past the shell company, past this pile of cash that they know is financing illegal activity. The trail goes cold and the investigation is stopped dead in its tracks. Treasury conducted a pilot program a couple of years ago where they collected beneficial ownership information for real estate transactions in Manhattan and Miami over a six month period. And the results were stunning. Treasury found that about 30% of the transactions reported in those six months involved a beneficial owner or purchaser representative that had previously been the, been the subject of a suspicious activity report. In other words, these were potentially suspicious people buying these properties. And this was after the Treasury Department had announced to the world that they would be collecting beneficial ownership information in these two cities for six months. They announced it. So this didn't even capture the money launderers who simply avoided these two cities for that six month period. Our bill would solve this problem by requiring companies to disclose their true beneficial owners to FinCEN at the time the company is formed. This information would only be available to law enforcement and to financial inst institutions so that they can comply with know your customer rules. This bill would plug a huge hole in our national security defenses and would be a massive benefit to law enforcement. But this bill would also shore up the safety of our financial system and would streamline the compliance costs for financial institutions that are trying to make sure that terrorists and criminals aren't secretly using US banks to move money around. 
Treasury passed a rule three years ago that requires financial institutions to collect the beneficial ownership information for all of their corporate customers, which was a very important rule. If you think about it, no American who walks into a bank branch can open an account without identifying themselves, without saying what their name is, what their address is, and providing some proof that they are who they say they are. So why should companies be able to open bank accounts and deposit millions and millions of dollars without also identifying who owns them. FinCEN's rule fixes that loophole, and I think it makes our financial system and our country safer. But it also puts the burden on the financial institution to collect the information rather than putting the burden on the companies themselves. Our bill would streamline this process by allowing financial institutions to access the FinCEN database of beneficial ownership information. That way, financial institutions will be able to better police the financial system because they will truly know who their customers are and will also ease the regulatory burden on financial institutions at the same time. This is a win-win. It helps law enforcement, it helps financial institutions better protect the US financial system, and it also reduces unnecessary regulatory burden. I wanna take some time to address one of the concerns that has been raised about the bill because I think this concern is not a well-founded one at all. Some people have claimed, if they want to criticize the bill, that it would be overly burdensome on small businesses. I don't think that's true at all. All of the experience in other countries that already collect beneficial ownership information has proven that it is very cheap for small businesses to comply. Critics have made wild claims about my bill costing small businesses millions of dollars. But in the UK, where they already collect this information, the cost of compliance for a, the average small business was only $200, and that's a one-time cost. It never repeats itself. So to me, this is a very modest price to pay for national security. In the UK, the medium company had one, one owners, which means that the vast majority of small businesses only have one owner. So for these businesses, they will only have to file one name with Vincent, just one. That's hardly burdensome. And we're only asking for four pieces of very basic information, your name, date of birth, current address, and driver's license number. For both business, business own, owners, it would take them less than five minutes to collect that information at most. According to a study by Global Financial Integrity, you have to disclose more information to get a library card then you have to disclose to create a corporation or LLC. And you don't hear people complaining about the burdens of getting a library card. So I think the idea that this disclosure would be unduly burdensome is simply false, period. The bill also goes out of its way to exempt every category of business that already discloses their beneficial owners, either to regulators or in public filings. This includes banks, credit unions, insurance companies, investment advisors, brokers, utilities, and nonprofits. The bill even exempts companies with more than 20 employees and over $20 million in revenues. Because if you have 20 employees and are actually generating a significant amount of revenues, then you're almost certainly a real business and not a shell company that is being used to launder money. In fact, in almost all of the cases where law enforcement has uncovered a shell company that is being used for illicit purposes, the company had either zero or one employee. That's why we felt comfortable exempting companies that have more than 20 employees. So I think we've gone way out of our way to ensure that the bill is appropriately tailored and is not burdensome on small business. The approach we've taken in our bill is the product of years of work, over 15 years, and years of comp compromises with different stakeholders all with a view of, to building the broadest possible coalition of support. And I think we've built a very large coalition. We have the support of 127 NGOs, all of the law enforcement groups, all of the banking trade associations, the credit union trade associations, human rights groups, state secretaries of state, most of the real estate industry, and many more. As I mentioned, we have very strong momentum for this bill. The Senate Banking Committee had reached a bipartisan compromise on their version of the bill right before the coronavirus hit, and were planning a markup of the bill for the end of March. 
which unfortunately had to be postponed because of the coronavirus crisis. But the fact that Chairman Crapo, Ranking Member Brown, and Senators Warner and Cotton could all agree that this bill needs to be passed is a great sign that when Congress eventually comes back, getting this bill signed into law can be one of the first orders of business. So I'm optimistic that the stars have finally aligned for beneficial ownership this Congress and that this bill will become law. I think there's broad agreement that our AML system should be both more effective and less burdensome. And so we're working hard to strike the right balance and to get these reforms across the finish line. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for inviting me to speak alongside my good friend, Peter King, on this very important issue. And I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for having me, the Wilson Center. Great to see you, Jane, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. King, please, the floor is yours. Matt, thank you very much. And let me at the outset uh, thank Jane Harmon for doing so much to arrange this and for the outstanding work that she does. I had the privilege of uh, not just being elected the same year as Jane, but also uh, uh, working with her on the Homeland Security Committee, which was formed after the attacks of 9-11. And especially when I was chairman of the committee, I had a uh, great reason to thank her for her bipartisanship. That committee by its nature could have lent itself to partisanship, it could have lent itself to uh, cheap attacks, uh, which all, all too often we do see in uh, parts of Congress. Jane was the ultimate bipartisan warrior. We were able to pass uh, bipartisan legislation on uh, chemical plant security, maritime security, any number of other issues that were so important as the whole uh, Homeland Security community was developing. And Carol Maloney, uh, again, uh, again, Carol and I also were elected in 1992. We uh, both represent New York, we're both on the Financial Services Committee, and we worked on many projects together. We're not always on the same side politically, but we almost always try to find a way to uh, eliminate the differences or minimize the differences and find ways to come up with a bipartisan compromise. But Ka Carolyn has been the real leader on this issue. Uh, this is something she's been involved in, as, again, as she, really since 9-11, uh, when we so first saw the uh, it really came home to us about how dangerous the whole concept of shell companies could be, terrorist financing, terrorist uh, uh, funds being transferred all, all over the world. So this, this bill, and uh, Carolyn's gone into you know, great detail on it. But the fact is that uh, it only applies to uh, companies of less than 20 employees. We have the support of really almost every uh, concerned stakeholder. Uh, Carolyn mentioned the NGOs, human rights groups. As far as I know, every police organization, they were extremely supportive of this. Uh, we made a point of having uh, all the information, all the data given to FinCEN. Others wanted to put it to another federal agency. We felt FinCEN was uniquely uh, qualified and able to, one, uh, collect the information and also to store it and to provide it as needed to the various law enforcement groups around the country, around the world. So this is, again, it's essential. Uh, it's very good news that it is making progress in, in the Senate. And uh, again, if they have a compromise bill, which is comparable to ours, it's up to all of us to make sure we get it through before Congress adjourns. I'll be leaving at the end of this year. Congress will still be in good hands with Carol Maloney. But I think it is important that while we do have this uh, consensus of opinion on the importance of this legislation that we don't let the opportunity pass so rather than to start over again next year with the new Congress and uh, all different issues that are going to be out there. Now, you know, while strike while the iron is hot, we have consensus. It was not easy to get there, but we did get there. So let's take fullest advantage of it right now. So with that, I will just yield it back. Carolyn went into great detail on uh, everything, and uh, I concur in everything she said, and I thank her and I applaud her for her efforts. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. King. I want to give the first question to Jane, and before I do, just to remind uh, those others who are listening uh, that if you'd like to pose a question, uh, please just go ahead and email Kenan at WilsonCenter.org, uh, tweet to at Kenan Institute, or post on our Facebook page, and please include your name and affiliation. But I don't have to say, wait for the microphone. Jane, please. <laughs> Well, thank you, Matt. And uh, Peter and Carolyn, you make me so proud. You do. I would like to freeze frame this entire Zoom effort uh, and showcase what competence and bipartisanship still looks like in this Congress. It's so rare. 
and it's so appreciated, not just by grandma, me, uh, but by so much of the public that is so uh, despairing and turned off by uh, the toxic partisanship up there, as I was, I've got to say, you, you, you both know that. And to you, Peter, I didn't mention that you're leaving, leaving. Uh, you know, I, yes, I, I did that a, a while back, um, and there is life on the other side, but your loss is huge because you have always reached across the aisle, but even more than that, behaved civilly with everybody and looked for answers to problems, putting our country first. Oh my God, putting our country first, which is really where it seems to me uh, your allegiance should be as, as a member of Congress who takes an oath uh, to observe and, and abide by the Constitution, which is our country's Constitution, not a political party's Constitution. Okay, that's the end of the speech. I, I am want to focus just in a question on this uh, more than or uh, less than 20 employee issue, because it seems to me if I were a bad guy, I could game that. I could mm -hmm. pad my, my role of employees. I could be in a startup, which most, most of them have good intentions, but a startup that started with more than 20 people. And I'm just wondering, uh, I'm sure Carolyn, because she thought of absolutely everything, uh, has thought of this, but what are the, uh, what's in this law or what could be in the regulations to implement this law that will prevent people from gaming the 20 person uh, limit? Well, what, uh, what I've been looking at is trying to pass the law. As I said, I've been working on it for 15 years. <laughs> tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, pushback on it. In fact, I, I've never worked so hard to get bipartisan support uh, with Luca Meyer and, and with uh, Peter King on the Financial Services Committee. Uh, when we passed it in the House, we carried, I think, 35 Republicans with us, but the leadership of the Republican Party came out against it. I can't tell you how hard it is to get members of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party to openly uh, fight their leadership on the floor. But we were able to do that on the merits of the bill. And one of the things that they hit with it is that it's burdensome, it's burdensome. That's why I talked almost five minutes on how it is not burdensome. And in many of the cases uh, where they do these shell companies, they, they, they have one employee or no employees. I mean, I have uh, examples of companies that uh, were headquartered in a, boom, in a broom closet in a school, that's their headquarters. I mean, th this is the way it is. But if you have 20 employees that you are paying minimum wage, financing, doing all the paperwork for, you have over $5 million in revenue, uh, that, that's a little harder to gain. Uh, that's a little harder to finance. And uh, a lot of times uh, the shell companies are nothing more than real estate. That's, the, that's what they uh, park the money in mainly. They just buy a building or they buy an apartment in New York, you can go through my district at night and uh, half the buildings don't even have uh, lights on. They're, they're bank accounts. Uh, and it's very easy to buy a, you know, a $5 million apartment and then you need $5 million to finance whatever activities you're trying to do. You just sell it, you've got the money and you can, you can do it. They, they uh, finance the entire 9-11 attack on, uh, on America at the Pentagon and at uh, uh, for very little money. I think it was like $500,000 was what they finally came down with. Uh, so some of these terrorist attacks, uh, they, they really don't need that much money. It's not millions of dollars. It's a, it's a, a you know, throwing a bomb out. Uh, that's what we've had in New York with our intelligence, uh, increased intelligence system that you and and uh, Peter worked on, we, we stop a lot of these attacks beforehand, but uh, we, we found that as a compromise that uh, 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 Peter was a hard negotiator, as was uh, Congressman Luca Meyer. Uh, this was what we came up with. Uh, we felt that that's a start. Let's get it passed. If we have to strengthen it, we'll strengthen it in later years. Uh, but as I said, 15 years is long enough. Let's get it passed. Let's get it signed into law. It is a huge, huge uh, security risk and loophole in our security laws. 
Okay. Yeah, Jane, I think it's uh, safe to assume that everyone is always going to try to game the system. This makes it more difficult for them. It narrows the gap a bit. And if we, uh, more has to be done, lady, we'll, uh, we will. But as Carolyn said, it was not that easy getting a majority together. There were different groups who were afraid of too much pressure and too much, uh, you know, being too burdensome. So, you know, the decision was made, and I, I agree with Carolyn on this, that we have the 20. If we can do that, 20 uh, employees plus the $5 million, that makes it, uh, more difficult for the bad guys to game it. I'm sure a number of them will. We'll have to address it then. But right now, we're cutting off some of the more obvious ones. And so it's a very, it's more than a first start. It's really, it's a, really a strong, lengthy step that we've taken. But again, uh, of, uh, whether it's going to require regulations or whether we have to go with increased uh, legislation, uh, I won't be here then. But again, I, I'm, you know, the Congress may have to act on that. But right now, this is really a very, very you know, significant beginning. Thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you both. Uh, I have a ton of questions, but we're already getting questions in. So what I want to do is is try to weave a few of them together. Um, first, a question uh, actually from uh, a diplomat at the UK embassy, uh, perhaps exercised by my mention of the UK along with the US uh, as a, a center of this problem, very well known uh, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet region. You know, London Grad is the joke about uh, Russian expatriate money uh, in the city of London. Um, so his question is, uh, what sort of message do you think the U.S. would send to international organized crime groups and other countries deliberating over whether to implement a register if Congress passes beneficial ownership legislation? And of course, uh, the U.K. did that recently, I think about a year ago. Well, first of all, I, I feel one step at a time. <laughs> I'm focused on getting this through. And, and as Peter knows and Jane knows, um, there's a, a lot of ifs still out there on whether or not you can get it through the United States Senate and signed into law. So I, I am focused on, on those steps first. Uh, we, we have followed, uh, actually, the UK and, and the European Union. Uh, they have already implemented uh, uh, disclosures, registries, and all kinds of things. But I'm just trying to pass this bill at this point. But I'll start, I always study what you, the UK is doing. We'll be studying that uh, in the future. But right now, I, I think we still have a huge uh, burden ahead of us. Uh, the only thing anyone's working on right now is COVID response and uh, getting our economy moving again and, and protecting our people, uh, uh, hoping to, to develop a vaccine. Uh, so we are uh, very, very focused on, on that, uh, all of the attention, all the committee work, everything. We were fortunate to get it through the House, uh, and we will be fortunate to get it through the Senate, given the current climate we're in. Yeah, I, I would basically agree with Carol, and also say that the, uh, you know, the Brits have been very close partners with us on so many issues, whether it's terrorism, uh, international finance, they are great allies to have. And again, as Carol said, this is our first step. We have to get this done first, and then we'll be looking to expand it. Because uh, to me, this is, uh, when you're talking about the kind of money is out there, and you're talking about the devious minds that are manipulating it, we know that more will have to be done. But it's important to have a solid base. And this legislation will be a very solid base to work from. And what we have to do after that, I think will have to be done. But we have to get this done first. Um, at, at risk of pushing <clears throat> uh, again on, on an open door, um, a question from Elliot Ross, who asks about another uh, part of the U.S. Congress, the Helsinki Commission. Um, he asks about a series of bipartisan bills uh, that I guess they've developed that are waiting in the wings to deal with kleptocracy more broadly. Um, it, is it on your radar screen at all to kind of make a package of, uh, you know, this effort and then maybe what you might call the demand side uh, of corruption abroad, you know, uh, targeting the kleptocrats themselves. Is that, is that something that you've thought about? Well, that is not in the Financial Services Committee. This, this uh, bill came out of the Financial Services Committee on which both Peter and I serve. And uh, I'm also on the leadership team that is looking at uh, legislation. That package of bills has not been mentioned in, in our leadership uh, deal. But right now, as I said, uh, responding to the coronavirus has taken all of the energy and focus. Um, I, 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 uh, I feel that I have great respect for anything that can pass the United States Congress and get what I call that very fragile flower of consensus that gets through 
the United States Congress and the Senate, it's not easy. Uh, Peter and I have worked together on a number of bills. They've all been difficult. They've all been unbelievably hard. And uh, every time we have a bill that's ready to move, everybody moves in and they have everything they want to attach to it. But if you attach it to it, it loads down uh, the bill and then sends it back for more hearings. And uh, uh, then it gives people who are really opposed to it on other levels an excuse to, to be against it. So I think after 15 years of working on this bill as a bill to move, that every law enforcement uh, leader in the country has endorsed. It to me is amazing that law enforcement has asked us to pass it. Please give us this tool so we can combat uh, terrorism in our country. And we still haven't passed it. So at this point, I'm opposed to loading up any other thing that would then require it to pass again the House, uh, have hearings again on the House, and would probably mean that it would not pass in this Congress. We have pushed it to this point. Let's push it over the, the, the uh, finish line. I'm proud to join the Helsinki Committee in a bipartisan way on what their initiatives are and participate in their hearings and help them pass whatever it is they're working on, but they haven't contacted me up to this point, nor have they mentioned it, nor has anyone mentioned it in, in the source of roughly 10 different hearings that we've had on it. Yeah, if I could just add to that, and I think Jane Harmon uh, will fully agree with me on this. One of the real problems we have with the Homeland Security Committee is that so many other committees can claim a piece of the jurisdiction. And we could have a simple, not a simple bill, but a bill that we, we uh, like chemical plant security, we worked on it with uh, great time and effort, port security. And then you'd find this committee or that committee would claim a small part of the jurisdiction and they could bark it down for months to get it through. Well, you had to make unreasonable concessions to them to move the bill. This bill that Carolyn and I have, and against primarily Carolyn, is a financial services committee bill. The last thing we want to do is to open it up in any way to allow any other committee to try to get a hold of it. Not that we're so, that there's a pride of authorship, but one thing in Congress that has to be streamlined is this multi-committee jurisdiction over bills. So I, uh, I agree with Carolyn. Let's keep this right now. It's finely tailored to the Financial Services Committee. Uh, nobody else can slow it down. And we start uh, putting any other uh, uh, bills attached to it or make it part of a package, then you just open it up to uh, delay, needless delay. And again, this is a solid base. We're going to go really, you know, from zero to 90 on this, put it that way. And then that other 10% we can fill in. But well, let's get this done. Let's build this solid rock of a foundation. And also I want to note in, uh, that Secretary Mnuchin supports the bill, which is uh, Secretary of Treasury, which is a huge step forward. So the administration is on record uh, supporting the bill also. And he has testified two or three times before the financial services committee in support of the bill. So we, we're having all the stars come together. So let's try to push it over the finish line. I want to I want to go back with you guys. I mean, I, I, Jane is very correct that uh, this this little rectangle in front of us is a microcosm of how bipartisanship should work because you're so focused on getting it done, which is actually a very rare thing in Congress today. And it's great to hear. But I want to take a couple steps back to what you talked about earlier, which is the kind of conceptual rationale for this thing. I hear terms that, you know, all of us have lived through the last couple of decades of post 9-11, like countering terrorism, countering illicit finance, if you will, the national security rationale, right? We have lived through a couple of decades in which um, that rationale, and I'm not arguing that is necessarily the case here, but, but you have to grapple with it has led to unintended consequences. So here we're going to be peeling back all kinds of layers of what are traditionally thought of as protections and you know, legal devices, like the legal personhood of a company that makes the American economy very, very special. It makes it very, it's a place where you can do things. You know, Jane asked about this earlier in a sense with the startup company, right? Um, and you, you've touched on some of the pros and cons, but if you could just address this challenge of the national security rationale for cracking open the door that then, let's say you get a massive flood of law enforcement interest that at the end of the day is not really about national security. Maybe it's about prosecutors deciding that they can target people, you know, here at home that they, that they couldn't target before, et cetera. Have you guys thought about that kind of, it's not really civil liberties per se, but it's maybe just the balance of motivation between what's pure national security uh, and, and what is maybe something else. How, how do you address that? 
Well, you, you can't just go fishing. You can't go into the file and look around. It is a, it is a secure file and you don't have access to it. Uh, the only way you would have access to it is if you were a prosecutor with an open case. In other words, you were, you were saying that uh, uh, this criminal was uh, uh, buying property and trying to finance uh, some activities or were t tied to Al-Qaeda or whatever. You'd have to have an open case to be able to go in and, and, uh, and you know, you would have to then apply to FinCEN and say, this is my case and it's opened and we're doing this, you know, it, it's not, it's not an idea. It's that, uh, you know, you have an open case that you are trying to prosecute. So you'd have to meet, meet the same standards that a prosecutor would have to meet no matter what. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's always this balance and especially so since 9-11. Uh, in fact, next week, when we come back to Congress, I, I believe we're going to vote on the uh, extension of FISA. The uh, court that was, was, was set up actually before 9-11, but it's really been uh, fully Im uh, implemented after 9-11. There's questions there of civil liberties, there's questions there of abuses. And so you're always trying to balance that. And so it's not easy, but we did try to take all of that into account with this. And we felt that FinCEN was the best repository for all this. And again, uh, it's, you know, prosecutors can always abuse, criminal defense lawyers can always abuse. Uh, it's, it's there, that's part of the system and it's up to us to try to monitor that. It's up to the courts to try to monitor it. And, uh, but it's not, not that it's easy, but also, you know, the constitution is not a suicide pact. We have to try to work, work within it to get the job done. Always aware that with human nature, there are people who are going to try to uh, abuse the system, just like there's, you know, the financial people are, uh, abusing the system with these shell corporations. So it's, uh, again, it's a balance. And Carolyn and I, again, we work carefully on this. Uh, do we have all the answers? I think we have most of the answers on this. But again, we work with law enforcement, we work with civil uh, liberties organizations. We work with those concerned with human rights. And uh, th to me, this is a balanced bill, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be supporting it. We have a, a great question uh, from Facebook. As I'm looking over the questions, I'm seeing uh, some of the names that I recognize. Uh, this individual introduces himself uh, as a, a certified fraud examiner with 35 years of international accounting and anti-corruption experience, uh, Don uh, Ruddeziel in Laramie, Wyoming. And uh, he asks, after a lifetime of fighting impunity, uh, which has been very frustrating, isn't it possible that money launderers will just move on to another jurisdiction after the U.S. closes current loopholes? And of course, the, the next logical question is, if that happens, what, what's the United States going to do about it? Well, at least they're not using the United States freely to launder money. Uh, as Jane said in her opening comments, uh, we are the easiest place, for, except for one other country. I'm, I'm curious what the other country is. But uh, she said we're number two in, in the ease. And I, I remember when the Pentagon when the Panama Papers came out, and I was saying, wow, this is really great. There are no, no Americans down in Panama laundering money. And then I thought, hey, they don't have to go to Panama. You can do it right here in the United States. Uh, so we're just making it a little more difficult. You know, they'll have to go offshore someplace, and they, they can go offshore. They, they go to the islands. They go other places. But at least they're not parking their money uh, and being able to access it easily in the United States. Yeah, you know, bad guys will always try to find another outlet, another source, and our job is to uh, uh, try to minimize that as much as possible. And, and if we can uh, reduce or stop the United States from being a safe haven for these people, and we, you know, we've, uh, we've served a purpose. We can't solve all the problems of the world, but we can make it more difficult you know, for, you know, for the criminal element. And yeah, that's what this bill does. And uh, our main responsibility starting is to uh, make sure we're doing all within the United States that they can't be taken advantage of. And then hopefully, uh, other nations can use us as uh, you know, one of the models you know, uh, to work off of. There's always going to be bad actors. There's always going to be corrupt uh, countries and governments. Uh, but again, you know, that, that's human nature. Our job is to try to minimize that as much as possible. And this bill does that here within the United States. You know, uh, as I was listening to you both, it occurred to me that one of the most popular shows, especially during the quarantine uh, on Netflix, has been Ozark. Uh, I don't know if you've watched it or heard about it but it's all about money laundering and the entire drama really is mm -hmm. about how an american working in this case on behalf of a mexican drug cartel uses you know uh 
a casino in Missouri and other, I don't want to spoil the plot for you, but <laughs> Uh, you know, other other shell companies right here in the very center of the United States uh, to launder money. So I guess your goal is to make that TV show kind of a a, a period piece, a historical drama, <laughs> and not and not a current drama. Um, here's here's a great question from uh, a former Wilson Center fellow, Camelia Bogdan, who happens to be a judge in Romania. Um, by the way, one of uh, two countries, Romania and Bulgaria, that the EU really took to task uh, for money laundering and other corruption as part of the EU accession process. They were very interesting cases of the ways in which kind of big and wealthy governments can pressure other governments to get their act together with some success. Um, she asks a great question though, which is um, in uh, 2019, the Financial Ask Action Task Force adopted updated guidance for risk-based approaches for legal professionals. Do you think that US legal professionals uh, should be subject to greater anti-money laundering and combating finance and terrorism regulation and supervision. I take it your legislation doesn't deal with the legal profession. It's, it's about the shell company side of it, the, the sort of yes. finance and ownership. What about the legal profession? Any thoughts on that? Well, the, uh, a large portion of the legal profession is opposed to this bill. In fact, there was a 60-minute uh, 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 you know, special edition that they interviewed uh, roughly 13 attorneys in America, and they came in and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm uh, representing a, uh, a, uh, a, a leader in Africa. He wants to hide zillions of dollars in yachts and apartments and doesn't want anyone to know, can you help us? And all of them but one said, yes, yes, come to us and put it in an LLC. Uh, one of them even said, whatever you do, don't go, go to a bank because uh, they'll have to reveal who you are. We can put it in an LLC. We can hide all the illicit money you want. Only one of the attorneys said, get out of my office. What you're trying to do is illegal. Uh, so uh, what can I say? So we are, are going to, uh, uh, we're attacking the LLCs uh, in this bill. We're not uh, you know, attacking the legal profession. Uh, P Peter, before you jump in, uh, that's just sort of too perfect. Uh, a, a question uh, came in from Tutu Alicante, the executive director of Equatorial Guinea Justice on exactly this point saying, uh, what are the tools in the act to target the enablers of kleptocracy, bankers, lawyers, accountants, escrow agents, and other professionals uh, in the United States uh, who create the shell companies, et cetera. So uh, that's exactly the point you were making, Congresswoman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, our, our bill is targeted, again, for the LLCs. Having said that, uh, if a lawyer is found to have been working to work around this. Uh, again, that, that that could be a violation of this law. So, I mean, that's the whole thing. And also you do have disbarment proceedings. You do have the bar associations being more aware of this. And again, there is that fine line between uh, defending an unsavory uh, uh, individuals entitled to stay in court, but doing it through totally legal means. And that, uh, you've, you know, we've had, let's face it, organized crime cases. We've had lawyers using uh, illegal uh, assets, you know, for their fees to be paid uh, or to uh, uh, sponsor the cases. So again, it sort of has to be monitored and uh, that would probably be the next step. But again, I think lawyers should be careful if they try to work with clients to surreptitiously violate or not comply with this act, as I would consider that to be a violation of law, certainly something that could be subject to, uh, to disbarment proceedings. I'm saying that as a former lawyer, I've been practicing years, but again, uh, no, no profession is perfect. And there are lawyers who have been engaged in uh, actually facilitating money laundering. Forget the international corporations or anything else. We're talking about just organized crime here in this country where lawyers have worked with clients to, you know, to hide the money, to launder the money. So that's, again, part of human nature. Hopefully this type of legislation is going to crack down on that and make it more difficult for them to do. Yes, well, as, as we often uh, say, I think a number of us on this call may be recovering lawyers. As we often say, you know, much occurs that should occur, but only in the shadow of the law. So having having the law out there may promote better uh, conduct by professional associations and so on. Related to that, we have a question from John Coogan, um, and I think this is important to clarify. He asks, um, uh, he mentions the, the the skeptical argument about burdening uh, small business, uh, et cetera, uh, but he asks uh, what this does essentially that FinCEN. Uh, doesn't already do in, in terms of the requirement that's been in place since May 2008 that companies have to disclose beneficial ownership to the bank in order to have a bank account 
or to purchase a banking product. He says, doesn't that remove the need for a bill like this? What's wrong with relying on FinCEN regs and on the banks themselves to do the due diligence? I can see some counter arguments to that, but let me let, me let you guys answer. Well, first of all, um, after 9-11, we put tremendous burdens on banks because uh, uh, we were very frightened of other terrorism attacks and we uh, made all of them know their customers. It's a, uh, it costs them hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to know their customers. This would be a centralized file that they can use to know their customers and cuts down on their uh, oversight. It, it centralizes it. It makes it more usable for, for law enforcement. It's not at every individual bank. It, it, uh, it is uh, just making the system uh, work. And also, you know, there's a huge difference between a regulation and a law. Uh, people violate regulations every day and regulations uh, can be changed and rolled back every day. I have never written a law in my life that wasn't a uh, important one, that a regulation came out right before the law passed saying, oh, we don't need the law now. We've got the regulation. But then if you look the other way, and when you're in Congress, you're always looking the other way because there's always a crisis of some kind. I thought 9-11 was horrible. I thought Sandy was horrible. I thought the downturn of 2008 was horrible. What we're living through now is all of those three terrible things combined. And it's taking all of Peter's energy and my energy to respond to it. So the minute you look away, they abolish the regulation. And that happens all the time. So when you have a law, you have something you can enforce and that is permanent and that cannot be changed unless you pass another law, at which point we will see the change going through. You don't see the regulations rolling back and uh, being changed. and. Uh, and uh, executive orders are uh, sometimes rolling back regulations. Uh, so a law is a law. And I will point out that the FinCEN regulation didn't come out until the law looked like it was about ready to pass. So this is just business as usual in Congress. Uh, the minute you're gonna get serious about a, a problem, uh, they come out, oh, we've got the regulation. Please go away, Maloney, you're bothering us. We've already taken care of it. It's all happiness and good faith and get lost. And uh, we're not getting lost. We feel that this is an important issue. We want the, the, want, we want the validity and the permanent uh, attention of a law. Yeah, also, I would add that virtually every major law enforcement organization in the country came to us and said that they believed this, this law was, uh, was necessary. Both national organizations, also uh, uh, lo uh, local and state police organizations, police departments themselves came to lobby us on this saying how important they, they thought it was, how important it was to have the force of law behind it and that it'd be centralized through FinCEN. I, I gotta add, very, when law enforcement speaks, and, and Peter uh, was very involved in supporting law enforcement um, and, and fire department in, in our city. Uh, but when they speak, usually Congress acts. When they come to us and say, hey, we need this change so that we can protect you. So we can protect you and your neighbors and your city and your country. And it's, it's in a sense astonishing that law enforcement has been pushing this ever since 9-11 for 18 years. They have been saying, give us this tool so that we can protect you more. And, and this is the first time we've gotten near the finish line of making it a, it a permanent law. So I think the point that Peter raised is really an important one, that this is coming from people whose job it is to protect us. And they're asking for us. And they're saying, we, we can protect you better if you give us this tool. So I think it's long over too. Well, we're, we're approaching the end here, but I want to try to get in two more questions if I can. Um, so relatively quickly, uh, first from uh, Kirsten Derinovsky at uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, she asks about the estimated cost for enforcement here uh, once the law is on the books. Um, and, and I would add to that, given what you said in response to the previous question about FinCEN and banks uh, bearing the burden, uh, is this going to be a, a money saver for banks that they'll have to do less, that they'll be the single resource for them? Maybe they should pay a small percentage tax on transactions or something that could pay for the enforcement costs to the people of the United States. Well, actually, the cost will be very little because we researched it in the UK. The UK, who has the system now, um, 
they estimate that it's $200 once in your lifetime for a small business or a business filing this information. As I said in my statement, it's basically five questions, your name, address, social security number, uh, name of your company, that's it. And uh, so it's, it, in, in fact, the research showed that it took more information to get a library card than to fill out the form for this. So the people that are opposed to it have been arguing that it's gonna cost money. It doesn't, cost $200 once in a lifetime. And they're saying it's too burdensome. It's not, it's just five questions. You can do it in less than two minutes. Um, this, this final question is really a hobby horse of mine. Uh, it's something we deal with uh, by no means exclusively, but certainly very much in the, in the think tank industry in Washington. <laughs> Um, I wonder if, if you guys as leaders on uh, money laundering and anti-money laundering would have some thoughts about the problem of reputation laundering for very similar people, often the same people. Uh, what they do is they come to Washington, and it's not only uh, they come to the United States, they come to the West. It's not only that they buy real estate as a way of kind of concealing their ill-gotten gains or you know parking their mistress or whatever uh, awful stuff they're up to. Uh, but they also, in a sense, buy legitimacy. They surround themselves with people who have, you know, current and former titles, and they, they sort of create a facade of being a part of uh, an, a legitimate international elite. And some of that is the money, but some of that is, is really just, uh, I, I don't think there's a better word than legitimacy. Uh, if you have any thoughts on that, I think that's, I think it's a really important problem that increasingly sort of erodes our moral credibility when we, when we let these people into the fold. Yeah, well, again, I don't, I, don't, I don't see how we can address that through legislation, but I agree with you completely about that being a, a real issue. Too often you've seen people like that. They live the big lifestyle, they have the money, they, uh, uh, they attach themselves to uh, prominent people here in, the, in, in this country who, who probably more often than not are not aware of the full background of what's happening here, and you can get sucked into that. No, and especially now, I mean, I mean, thank God for the fall of the Soviet Union. But on the other hand, it opened up a whole array of different issues we never thought of before, or certainly never thought of them you know, to this extent. So you have then also, obviously, coming from the Middle East, you have, again, uh, big money people, oil people coming here. And uh, you know, they end up uh, uh, contributing to large universities, becoming uh, 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 very active in prominent charities. And they do get this aura of, of, of respectability, which is terrible. I think that's more up to us as leaders and to the media and to academics to try to expose that and to point that out and not just fall for the fact because a person is getting a building named after himself at a university that suddenly he you know, becomes respectable and his human rights record back home or his uh, uh, flagrant corporate violations uh, somehow go away. We have to, again, I don't know what the answer to that is because this is how you go back to the Bible, I guess, of people who have the stature, have the money, and others attach themselves to them, and they end up, in some cases, literally getting away with murder. Uh, I want to go to Jane uh, for our final two minutes here. I'm, I apologize to those whose questions I didn't get to. Many more fantastic questions, but uh, you guys have both been wonderful. And, and Jane, would you close us out, please? Yeah, I think we need to do the sequel. Uh, this is, you know, once this legislation passes the Senate, and boy, Peter and Carolyn, you're going to make it past the Senate. We need to do the sequel about the whole subject. Uh, this, it's, it's so impressive. I, I want our audience to understand this. It is so impressive to see two members of Congress from different parties uh, serving on the same committee and working together to try to get a bill passed. Peter said it's 90% of perfection. Uh, I don't know that I ever achieved that in my life, uh, but that's pretty damn good, just got to say. And, and they're both right that they've got to keep the jurisdiction in one committee because if they don't, they'll, this thing will never happen. And maybe listeners wonder why Congress is organized like this. I think that's a fair question. It's for another panel, but uh, it is organized like this. And I remember how hard it was to get things like maritime security laws or even the, the, the law setting up the director of national intelligence, which is something mm -hmm. I'm very proud of having played a key role in, right. Uh, right. through Congress. Oh my God, it was hard. So I, I, I wanted to close with this. Matt, you started with this move at the, of the RADA in, uh, in Ukraine, the RADA's the legislature there, um, finally uh, trying to get over the endemic corruption that it has been part of over all these recent years in Ukraine, 
uh, by allowing uh, the hiring of outside counsel. I mean, some lawyers really are good and noble uh, who could help fight corruption. That's enormously cool. And I think we should celebrate that. I think we should really celebrate uh, this effort in our own country, which most people are not aware of, to, to close a loophole, a, a loophole that has been exploited to our detriment. And this legislation seems to be doing it. So the Wilson Center doesn't lobby for legislation. So I'm not lobbying for legislation. I'm just commenting that here are two people in different parties who add so much value to our, our current political life, which needs so much value. So I, I, I can't say enough how grateful I am to both of you for being on this uh, program and to you, Matt, because your questions were excellent. So that's it, folks. That's all, folks, as they used to say in Howdy Doody. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great. Great to see you, Jane.